Hi there, Dr. Terry Shaneyfeld for UAB School of Medicine. In part four and final installation of this series on subgroup analyses, I'll talk about how to interpret the results of a subgroup analysis. We'll talk about things you need to consider to determine if the subgroup effect is plausible or potentially just a false positive finding. So if our subgroup analysis has been designed properly and analyzed properly, now it's time to interpret the result and see if there really is a subgroup effect. I've developed an app to call EBM Rater, which also contains this information and can help you critically appraise all the other different study designs. So here's a portion of the subgroup analysis done by the Courage investigators published in the New England Journal. Courage was a study done in patients with chronic stable angina to see if medical therapy was better than PCI in preventing cardiovascular outcomes. This is just a portion of the subgroup analysis. I'd like you to pause the video and interpret this this figure. Is there a subgroup effect? Does one of these subgroups have a differential effect of the intervention than the other? Restart the video and we'll discuss the results. So what do you think? Is there a subgroup effect? Well, there's two ways we could try to figure this out. One is we could look over here at individual event rates or absolute event rates, or we look, could look at relative event rates. And it's actually recommended that you focus on relative effects and not absolute effects. Now, when you interpret the primary results of a study to make sense of it, we recommend you look at absolute effects. But in this case, you want to look at relative effects. And the reason is, is that relative effects tend to be consistent across subgroups. So if you really see a big difference, then it's going to probably be real. But you expect to see fairly consistent effects of an intervention, relatively speaking, across a subgroup. Absolute effects are probably always going to be a little bit different because higher risk people are going to gain more benefit or more harm than lower risk people if the intervention is effective. So what we can see here is most of these subgroup effects are fairly consistent and nothing really exciting. But all of a sudden, if we look here at this gender differences, it looks like there could be a difference. It looks like there's a differential effect in females than in males for the intervention. It looks like females gain a little bit better benefit by undergoing angioplasty. And when you look over here, you see a p-value of 0.03. That's below that 0.05 threshold. But if I'd have shown you the... the um, legend of this figure, you would have seen that after adjusting for multiple interactions that a p-value of 0.01 was actually a statistically significant p-value. So while we have a suggestion of gender differences, it didn't quite reach statistical significance in the interaction test. So we also can believe subgroup effects if they're very large. So again, we're trying to be sure that our subgroup effect is real and not a false positive finding. So the bigger that subgroup effect, the more likely it is real and not a false positive. If there are other studies that show the same subgroup effect, it becomes a little bit more believable because we keep seeing a consistent finding. We also like to see if there's some biologic rationale for why this subgroup effect might exist. And sometimes it comes from external evidence like animal studies or maybe using a surrogate endpoint. If it shows a um, similar subgroup effect with a surrogate, we can maybe believe in this more hard clinical outcome study that the subgroup effect is real. And finally, if we can show that there are things that are sort of similarly related outcomes um, show the same effect in the subgroup, then it becomes more plausible. So for example, let's say we're looking at quality of life in a study and we see a subgroup effect of um, one measure of quality life and if other measures of quality li of life are also used and show a similar subgroup effect it's probably a real finding. And finally these are four very good articles if you want to learn more about subgroup analysis and some of the challenges related to them uh, I recommend uh, any of these four articles. I hope this video has helped you understand how to interpret the results of a subgroup analysis and determine if the results were plausible. If you have any questions, you can contact me through the contact me section of my blog. Have a great day.